that. But Dr. Kiza Vesije has his two cents on the matter. I'm delighted to be seated next to him to have these conversations. Not just a politician, but a human rights activist. You know this. But good morning to you, doctor. A very good morning, Priscilla, and uh, good morning to all the viewers and uh, listeners, wherever you are joining us from this morning. Uh, it's a cool day here in Kasangati, and uh, you are most welcome. Asante sana. Uh, doctor, we want to start off on a light note. Uh, recently, you made a comment about Liverpool's nine goals uh, that came out of a single game, and you said to Simbu Day. So there's Manchester United fans who are wanting to hear from you uh, what you think about Manchester United, and where do you think they'll finish at the end of the season? Well, the nine goals, of course, as you've said, uh, you know, uh, a real massacre that happened at Anfield by Liverpool. Uh, uh, I understand it's the second time that Liverpool is, uh, you know, getting such a feat of uh, scoring nine against their opponents. Um, and it was, you know, a greatly one-sided show uh, by all accounts, um, and, and that's why, you know, I say that there is carnage at Anfield. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> as you may know, I'm not uh, a Liverpool fan. I used to be uh, until the 90s, uh, the 1990s, when I shifted to Manu. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's a new development. <laughs> All right. And so my two symbol there was in respect of money. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Which, as you okay. know, was at the bottom of the table. Oh, yes. That's very true. <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and uh, so it was a relief mm -hmm. uh, when they were being... Uh, known as going to lose against uh, Liverpool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Liverpool, uh, this is why I said, you know, Liverpool's nine seems to have been vengeance against what had happened to it previously okay. because it was uh, our companion at the bottom of the table and, uh, and had suffered, uh, uh, of course, uh, a defeat at Man U. Uh, so, yes, it's a very interesting start of the season because uh, these are teams that would normally be up there and they've started the season at the bottom. Okay. Uh, I still think that, uh, you know, the teams that have been at the top will possibly remain there. Man City, uh, Liverpool. Uh, I think Man U will be in the mix in, there. In the top four. Uh, quite obviously, Arsenal has started the season uh, in a very, very high gear. And uh, that's why there is uh, a lot of vibrance in Kampala mm -hmm. and a lot, a lot of uh, Uganda because Man U has uh, very huge and noisy fans. <laughs> the noisy neighbors. <laughs> Around here. Yes. Yeah, so uh, it's likely that Arsenal will also be in the mix there, possibly. Okay. Uh, so we are going to have an interesting season. All right. Um, we're also ending the month on an interesting note. Uh, we'll start off by uh, having you pick one of uh, those papers to direct us on which direction we're going to go in terms of the three topics we're going to talk about. Okay, I'll take the one next to me. Okay. All right, that's uh, number two. Parish development model. Will it scale lofty heights or is it a white elephant? Let's start with that. Well, you see, there is no development model, parish or anything else, that can succeed in an environment that is anti development. So there is no development model that can succeed in the current NRM Junta environment. And why am I saying this? This is because, you see, development, uh, and especially, you know, national development, because you have development, there has been a lot of development. And um, this is, uh, uh, 
sometimes mistaken as national development, uh, and, 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 and it's always hyped, you know, there are buildings coming up all over the place, uh, they even talk about the roads, infrastructure. Uh, infrastructure has been developed. That doesn't necessarily translate or even be remotely uh, related to uh, national development. National development, we talk about broad-based development. And um, uh, what we have, the system we have now in Uganda is a brutally extractive system of, 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 of the economy where the majority of the people are, you know, being, uh, you know, extracted from by a very narrow uh, group uh, in the country. Uh, so, such an extractive environment, in fact, brutally extractive, where you take from everybody but return literally nothing, cannot lead to a national development. It can lead to uh, some kind of a satellite development, which is not sustainable. Because at the end of the day, extraction without investment leads to, uh, you know, death of where you are extracting from. It's like milking the cow without feeding it. Eventually, the cow dies and you will have no milk. And that's what has been going on all this time. So. Even when funds are, uh, you know, uh, disbursed as uh, going to service the interests of the population, the system, the corrupt, inherently corrupt system, it's inherent, it's systemic, cannot allow those resources to reach where they are intended, and whatever reaches there will be sucked back into the uh, small group that, co that owns the country, that controls the country. So uh, that's why we have seen uh, all these programs before this uh, parish development model, whether it's St. Andiqua, whether it's, uh, there was even a plan for modernization of agriculture, whether it is Bonaba Gagawale, whether it is uh, Mioga. Uh, Mioga, whether it is wealth creation, I don't know, whatever wealth creation is something, none can have an impact in terms of national development because all that money, first of all, that is talked about is insignificant in terms of what has been taken from the people. So it's just crumbs. Have you ever thought, uh, Priscilla, about where this money that they are talking about as a parish model came from, which they are, you know, noisily saying we are bringing money to develop. Where did it come from? It came from those parishes. Every single coin in the government comes from the parish. So then, Doctor, isn't it fair to say that the government is being considerate, but this time around, instead of having the obstructs that you have talked about earlier, uh, the models that they had used earlier, that, uh, you know, were shaky and were not reaching the end user, the parish development model, uh, maybe could benefit the end user that actually pays the, t the taxes to the country. Um, going through the parishes and the systems, uh, so, when so you look at people, these leaders on that grassroots so, level so know these people, they know who is engaged. So, so, to so benefit two from the main reasons model. why it won't. Yeah. First of all, as I have told you, the amount is insignificant. Even when they talk about a hundred million going to a parish, it's insignificant. That hundred million is coming from billions that came from the parish. I'm telling you that that money is 
all of it came from the parish in the first place. A lot was used on the way taking it. A lot is taken where it was stored. And this insignificant amount is coming back. So you have taken away so much, you are returning so little. That's why its impact cannot be felt. Secondly, in order even for the little to have the effect that it could have, you need an efficient, effective, institutional mechanism. So what would you we don't have institutions. refer to as uh, we don't, an institution? We don't have institutions this? that could uh, implement any, any, any program efficaciously. Doctor, we don't have, but if so, in your capacity, so, what would so, be the so institution? So without that institutional mechanism, yeah. Even the little that is supposed to go there will be actually stolen or misused. And you have already seen this in play, even as we talk now, having launched uh, ceremoniously the parish development model. Mm -hmm. Where has the money gone? Has it reached anywhere? Has anybody benefited from it? We are now talking September. Where is that money? It's not there because there was no institutional mechanism. They didn't know who the beneficiaries were going to be. They didn't have the system on the ground to implement it. Many places didn't even have the parish chief, and the parish chief is at the center of this program. The, the parish chiefs don't know what this parish model is, so they have to be trained first. All this did not, did not fall in place, and there is no, um, uh, a, 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 you know, uh, outlined uh, mechanisms of how the beneficiaries, the beneficiaries themselves, to know what to expect from this and how to utilize it. So the beneficiaries themselves should have been given information well ahead of, of, of this happening. All this did not happen. And, and that is because the real intention is not so that there is a development. The real intention is just politics, to calm down people, say, by the way, things are going to change. Money okay. is coming. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a political gimmick. It has nothing, absolutely nothing, to do with, uh, with the development. Okay. So because of those two main reasons, first of all, the extractive element, the fact that you are taking away so much and returning so little. Because, uh, uh, think about it, since this money came from the parish, if you want the parish to have money to use, why even first take it in the first place? Why not leave it with them? Because you could reduce taxes. It's the tax that brought this money you are taking to them. You could reduce the taxes so that the money they would have given you they have it and can use it in their own uh, imagination of how to develop themselves. They don't have to develop according to what you tell them. People have the inherent capacity to develop themselves. So why first take the money, spend a lot of money taking it, spend a lot of money bringing it back when, when you could have left it with them? So this, the, this whole thing is simply not, intent, not about development. The, the infrastructure, which is sometimes hyped, infrastructure is double-edged. It can bring development, it can take, take away. away. And what we have seen in an extractive system, it is meant to take away. So people grow their maize, you come and take it for a, for, 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 uh, for, for, for a smile, you know, you, 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 uh, giving them all, literally nothing, you take it away using the infrastructure you have brought to them to suck their production, and in return they get nothing. That's what the colonial governments did. They didn't uh, build the railway line to Kasese, to develop Kasese. The railway line was going to Kasese to extract and take away. They were building roads to carry our coffee, our tea, our cotton for a song and nothing back. That system has not changed, and that's why the parish development model simply has no, 
no chance. Doctor, how then do we get to have a broad best development that benefits it every starts, single Ugandan? It starts where the broad starts. It starts at the bottom. The people must have a voice, must have a say in how their wealth is applied. And that's why if you live in a country where people have no voice, where they have no say, where leaders are owners, and you've heard Mr. Museveni saying, I am not a servant of anybody. He's the master. He, deci he decides. He's the institutions. If people have no say, they have no share. People, uh, so we must first of all recover the voice of the people of Uganda. They must be the owners of the country, the controllers of their resources. They must be the masters of the country, and leaders must become their servants and do their will. And if they don't, people must have power to throw them out. The people of Uganda have never, since Uganda became Uganda, they have never removed the leader from power. Never. Up to today, since Uganda became Uganda, the people of Uganda have never removed the leader. That, that should strike anybody as a very, very uh, strange and uh, tough place to be, where you cannot change your leader. And so that's where this must start. And then we must, people must make laws and regulations that are fair to all of them once they have power. Then they, they can build institutions from the, that legal framework, from the standards that people set. They can create institutions that are uh, independent and competent to implement whatever decisions they make, whatever the people's decisions are. And that is the transition that this country needs to transit not from just Mr. Museveni, but from control of power by a few people, to control of power by the population. And that is a struggle that will cause that. Okay. All right. Well, it has to be shared by all, not just by a few who give it then to the many as breadcrumbs uh, as referred to by Dr. Kiza Vesije. Okay, let's uh, move on to the next conversation we want to have with you this morning. Should you pick? Okay. Okay, that's number one, which brings us to the conversation regarding the late General Eli Tumwine. What legacy does he leave behind for politicians is uh, what we broadly want to understand. But you eulogize him saying, old soldiers never die, they fade away. What do you mean by that? Yeah, it's uh, uh, sad we are losing many people, and I, I, I just learned last night about the passing on of a dear friend and uh, a comrade in this struggle that we are talking about, a struggle to, uh, to, 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 to empower the people of Uganda, the late uh, now uh, Honorable Yona Kanyomozi. Uh, who has been a very, very uh, strong leader in terms of uh, uh, advocating for the changes that this country needs. He has passed on. Very, very sad. My condolences go to uh, his family and um, all relatives and friends, and indeed to all the uh, people that um, uh, seek justice in this country. Now, regarding uh, General Tumwine, uh, I similarly would like to first uh, uh, convey my uh, condolences to the family of the late General uh, Eli Tumwine uh, and to his uh, relatives and his friends and. Uh, and all those that he has been associating uh, with, uh, it's uh, sad to lose uh, any Ugandan. Uh, it's sad to lose 
and a person, whether it's not, it's not a Ugandan, you know, I've been uh, saying that we need to reflect deeply about humanity. Uh, I come from a background of the belief uh, in God. And from that background, I truly believe that we are all brothers and sisters. Um, because we all originate from Adam. Uh, that's why in Kiswahili they, they, they say we have been Adam, been Adam, the children of Adam. And, and, and so we are truly brothers and sisters, whether you are white, brown, yellow, what, in color, uh, whatever thinking you may have and uh, ideologies you may have, we are brothers. Even brothers of the same family are not the same. Uh, in fact, even twins, not just brothers of the same family, but even those who come from the womb at the same time, <laughs> they are different. And, and those differences are all right. We should celebrate our differences. Uh, sometimes they bring us into conflict. And uh, we should sort out our conflicts. But that does not take away uh, the humanity that we are and that we are brothers and sisters. Uh, beyond that, of course, I have known Genoeli Tumwine closely. So I would feel sad even if it was somebody uh, in Alaska whom I have learned has died. I would feel sad uh, regardless of how he has died or whether I knew him or personally or not. Now, for General Tumine, is somebody that I have known uh, fairly closely, worked with. He was my commander uh, for quite some time. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and so I know that, uh, you know, uh, I have lost somebody that I relate with. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and, and that is uh, saddening. Uh, and so um, that's why, you know, I am uh, expressing my condolences to those especially who have been closer to him in the latter years. I have not been close to him uh, since uh, uh, many, many years ago now, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> And uh, uh, we have even been uh, conflicting. Uh, he was the chairman of a court that was supposed to try me for a capital offense, uh, to sentence me to death if uh, uh, I had been found guilty. Uh, happily, we eventually fought out of his court. Uh, and um, the constitutional court said that he was wrongly trying me, and, uh, and uh, we left his court. But as, as I'm sure you remember the drama while we were in his court, uh, he detained my lawyers and uh, tried them and sentenced them <laughs> and uh, carried out the sentence. <laughs> so we, we, we have, at a personal level, uh, had uh, conflict. Uh, and, uh, and we have been uh, definitely of different beliefs uh, in, the last, uh, in the last 30 years. If, if I can pause you right there, when you said different beliefs, um, you joined the NRA struggle because you believed in what they were doing and you served under them. So when you said different beliefs, at what point did it become different beliefs? You see... Uh, the, and, and, and maybe, again, talking about General Tumwine and his legacy, I think his legacy is split, you see. It is split, first of all, between public life and private life. Uh, in his private, he has a private life. He has a family, he has a, 
relatives, he has associations, he, he has fellowships and so on, and uh, he has a village where he comes from, and a community in his village. Uh, and so there is a legacy of him in that arena. And he will be viewed very differently, I'm sure, by those that he has been associating with in that arena. And then there is the public uh, uh, legacy. Uh, and in the public legacy, we need to separate two periods. The period when he was not in government and the period when he was, and many of his colleagues have been in the government. So you see, in the 1980s and 70s, coming from 70s, Uganda went through very, very traumatic experiences. Uh, during the military government of uh, General Field Marshal Idi Amin, uh, that voice I was talking about mm -hmm. was totally obliterated. There were no elections under Amin. He had declared himself a life president, uh, and uh, he ruled by decrees. And uh, it was a military government, so the military were in charge of everything. And the removal of that government was through war a very bitter war led by the Tanzanian army. And, uh, and, and, and so many of us who were adults then believed that the change that had come in after that war was going to take the country in a different yeah. direction yes. where Ugandans would have a voice. Uh, and would be in charge of the country and would direct their country. Uh, and that, many of us uh, got shocked, therefore, in the 1980 elections, which was the first election since independence, and therefore the first opportunity to see whether that voice was being recovered. And to our uh, dismay, the military, even at that time in 1980, again became very active in the elections and uh, uh, intimidating and terrorizing uh, those. Which is something we've been seeing in our elections. Yes, precisely, yeah. precisely. Those the who, irony of Yes, it. those who yeah. were uh, believed not to be supporting a particular side. And, um, and it was during those elections indeed that Mr. Museveni started saying, because he was a leader of a party that I supported, the UPM, Uganda Patriotic Movement, then uh, was a new party. Uh, and many people were in the old parties, DP and UPC. So the new party, really, we were in it not so much that we believed we could win, but to establish a new platform, new politics. Because the politics of the other two parties were the ones that had in the first place caused the disaster that we were emerging from. So we thought we could establish a new platform and, and supported uh, a new party. And, and because of the intimidation and harassment of the military, that's when Museveni started saying, I think if you continue this way, we shall fight. And indeed, the election of 1980, I have been hearing a lot of talk about uh, the legitimacy of the government of 1980 to 85. My very, very clear view is that it was illegitimate because the election itself was problematic, but even that problematic election was not allowed to go on up to the end as the results were coming in. And the chairman of the Electoral Commission was my, my very uncle. He was an uncle of mine. He was the chairman of the Electoral Commission, a man called Kosia Chichira. As they had started correcting and announcing the results. The leader of the military commission then, which was uh, in charge of the country, Paulo Muanga, came on radio in the afternoon and made a special announcement and sacked the electoral commission. 
which had organized and was conducting the election, said with immediate effect the electoral commission is dismissed. All the powers of the commission will be exercised by myself, the chairman of the military commission. It is only me who will announce the results. <laughs> and anybody who tries he imposed the stiff penalties for anybody who tried to announce the results. And he took over the process. Yet he was one of the leaders of a contesting party. In that, uh, he was a, a UPC leader. So a party took over the management of the election. That's why those, the outcome of that election, regardless of what the real voting could have been, the resultant part, uh, uh, government could not have been legitimate. And, and, and so, uh, you know, those who took a stand to challenge it, and not only was it uh, uh, illegitimate, but there were a lot of abuses of human rights going on, both before and after the elections. So those who took a stand to say, we shall not lose our voice again, we shall fight for our voice, that was a courageous stand to take. And Genotumine was among those who took the stand to say, we shall we refuse this and we shall fight it, and headed off to fight. You see, for me, I believe that one should take a stand in life and, 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 and fight for that stand. Even if that stand is wrong, one should have a stand. The trouble is that we live in a country where many people simply have no stand. They don't stand anywhere. And if they do, they are not willing or able to fight for the stand they hold. So the Tumwines took a stand, and it was a courageous stand, to take a stand to challenge a government. Whether you like it or not, it's a courageous stand to say, I'm going to challenge this government. And they took that stand. And I believe that it was a legitimate stand the method of fighting using violence, using guns, I have shifted from that position. But at that point in time, and I didn't, you know, I was not part and parcel of taking that stand, no. I had only supported the party, and when it had, uh, when the outcomes became disappointing, I went back to my profession. Even if it had not been disappointing, I had no intention of support becoming a politician, yeah. so I ju had just rendered support. I had gone back to my profession as a medical worker. Only for having taken that stand to support these people, I was grabbed myself. And, you know, uh, went through a very horrifying experience under detention, torture, you know? I was lucky to get out alive. Many people I was with, incarcerated with, now in the now uh, International Conference Center, that's where the prison where we were was. And torture chambers were in the rooms of what was then Nairo Mansions, the Serena Hotel, had torture chambers. Many people I was with in that prison have never been seen again up to now, you know? And these were not, they, they were important people. There was an ambassador, magistrate, what, senior citizens, uh, farmers, whom we were with, they have never been seen up to now. So the gross violation of human rights, the taking away of people's voice, made the struggle against that government a legitimate struggle. And Geno Tumwine, who was among the people that started that struggle, therefore, I recognize as courageous people who took a courageous step and a stand in life to say, I oppose this and I am willing 
to sacrifice for my stand. And the war was uh, a difficult thing, expectedly. We shall, by the grace of God, write books to talk about that as we saw it. So that is, and General Tumwine was a leader in that, in that process. By the time I joined the war in 1982, General Tumwine was a deputy commander. The commander then was uh, Commander Sam Magara, who passed away unfortunately that year, 1982. He had come to Kampala, and I think where he was staying, he was betrayed and attacked there and killed. And then General Tumwine took over the command. So when he took over the command, tell us about that general uh, under whose command you were. Well, uh, he was not a particularly uh, popular commander because uh, uh, he, I think, did not have closeness and uh, comradeship with the fighters. He was a bit aloof. He was rigid, you know, whatever he wanted, uh, even if it caused the problems, he would not, he was not quite flexible, uh, which are a useful, uh, you know, um, uh, attributes in, in struggles like those. Uh, and, 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 and so, uh, he, he he was, uh, he, he had authority, and of course, you know, in the military, uh, uh, authority and, uh, and, and, and order is, uh, is, uh, is almost everything. Uh, if you give an order, even if it has problems, people will do their best to implement it. But um, uh, he, he, he was not, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of uh, soldiers uh, commander, uh, uh, which, uh, for example, the General uh, Rui Gemans uh, were, or even General Saleh, or, you know, Pecos, you know, who were uh, commanders that uh, soldiers felt, you know, uh, yeah. yes. Uh, um, and, um, but as I have said, you know, we will have time to okay. discuss that. Now, this is the first part of the public legacy that I am talking about. Now, the second part of, the, of that legacy is in the government. The other place, you had no power, and we were saying we want everybody to have power, the population, that that's why it's, it, we have taken this stand, that's why we are making these sacrifices, so that there is a transition to popular democracy, to people exercising control over their country. That was the, that was the whole purpose, for which very many people sacrificed, even gave their ultimate sacrifice, their lives. Half a million people died in that war. Many suffered immense immensely, and told suffering. Many have never recovered and will maybe never recover for that cause. So the second part is problematic. How that then has played out by those who succeeded in taking power from the people that they were fighting. Where do we stand in all those things that we fought for? The people's voice. I've been saying, you know, in 1980, that election, I am aware of only one person that was killed. It was a very troublesome election, violence, what? But I remember only one person was killed directly in the electoral processes. But consider how many people are killed in any election that takes place since 1980, 19, 1986. 
You know, any election becomes like a war. It's like a war has broken out. You see armored vehicles, you know, uh, coming out. So we can uh, comfortably say a repeat of history. A repeat would is mild. It, because as I have said, whereas only one person died in the election that took us to the bush, now hundreds die. <laughs> Let's talk about the general you know, uh, as the man in the government that you're talking about. He, as you have mentioned, he was aloof, rigid, and he was not, he was the one to just do exactly what he wanted, regardless of how it would affect other people. He spoke his mind and not propaganda. So there was that famous incident in November uh, highlighting shoot to, or to kill orders. What do you make of that? Uh, was it an impact of his direct participation in the war and the liberation, therefore, he had and among other Ugandans? Well, uh, or uh, as it was uh, down uh, to a personal You see, issue? as I have said, uh, uh, first of all, uh, regarding General Tumwine himself, one of his uh, shortcomings, I think, in the government was he, his partisanship. Because he has remained a serving officer up to his death. Now, a serving officer, a uniformed officer, must not show. It's not that you must not have, but you must not show sides. Partisanship. It's fundamentally wrong because you are the protector of all and you must be seen in that light. Now, there are professional people in the military who have remained there. For example, there is a general uh, called Yoram Mugume. Very few people, I'm sure, know this general. He's, uh, he's a very, uh, you know, distinguished fighter. In fact, whereas, you know, the, the, at the level of the general twinners, they hardly went to, to war, people like General Yoram Mugume were at the very front. In fact, he was at a very, very active front in, in a, a company called Company B and uh, remained at the center of the fight up to the end. He's held, he was the chief of combat operations uh, of, the, of the NRA and UPDF. But you never hear him anywhere. In, he, has been, he was also a member of parliament, you know, like General Tumwini. Uh, uh, but he remained professional. Tumwini didn't. Tumwini became partisan. And uh, fortunately, his partisanship is acknowledged by the NRM. I have heard in the uh, eulogies that the NRM leaders have been making, saying, yes, Tumwini was uh, uh, an NRM uh, uh, activist. Now, that is very wrong. If you want to become a partisan, then you take off the uniform. That's why it is even wrong for Mr. Museveni to, to appear in our uniform. It's wrong because he's a party leader. You should not appear in uh, the uniform of the UPDF. Mr. Museveni is wrong, commits an offense actually to come in uniform of the country as the NRM chairman. <laughs> he's wrong. So that is one of the areas where I think that going off the script of why we fought uh, uh, takes shape. So in that trajectory of defending now not the national ethos, the popular uh, beliefs of the country, to defending partisan. And, and I think Zeno Tumwine even went a little beyond defending and supporting partisan interests uh, of NRM to 
personal interests of General Museveni. Uh, to Mwine, you could reason with him, and uh, he was a reasonable person. So you could reason with him all the way until you reach what affects Museveni. Then you disagree. Not only will you, dis will you disagree, he will not be willing to reason. <laughs> at, that st <laughs> at that stage, reason stops. He was a bit like General Kale Kayura. <laughs> In that regard, <laughs> General Kale Kayura is a, is a very reasonable man. Until you touch <laughs> Until the you ground. reach. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think uh, what uh, has, uh, what you are talking about is advised by that tendency a wrong tendency very clearly that uh, many of our colleagues took. Now, that tendency also has created a big problem for the country, a general problem, because as I have told you, that tendency ended up being a tendency that favors a few. Yes. Uh, and uh, and disadvantages the rest, which actually uh, we are now experiencing the results of, because as you have seen after General Eli Tumwine, even before he was declared dead, there were fake news that he had died. But the fake news, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, generators, we are generating them in a celebratory mood, saying, you know, uh, have you had, you know, wonderful news that uh, General Tumwini has died, you know, and, uh, and the divide is very clear, you know, where p some people are publicly celebrating, even in writing, saying this is a wonderful thing. One of those has also gone. Um, I'm sure many others who are not expressing it publicly don't feel sad that General uh, Tumwine has gone. Why? Because the system that that system that extracts from the many the system that benefits a few uh, creates bitterness it's a system that embitters those who are disadvantaged that makes them angry and this anger has been building of people who can't simply subsist, who can't okay. survive. And that's why we are saying now there is a crisis of failure to thrive. Many people simply can't get by on account of others who are thriving beyond measure. You know, I have been talking about how this is demonstrated by the way Genome 70. And, and, and you see, once people stay in power, they become insensitive. They become decadent. Which then begs me to ask, Doctor, mm. um, that insensitivity that comes with staying long in power seems to be affecting so many politicians that when uh, the day of calling comes, uh, you have talked about people <laughs> celebrating. That's what's happening to many of them. So, in a nutshell, what would be your advice to those that still have a legacy, an opportunity to create a legacy? What would be your advice to politicians who are still breathing and uh, are in that kind of line of leadership, have come from that stain post um, uh, terrible Uganda into the struggle, past the struggle, and then where they are right now facing the same predicament that the fallen general has You see facing. that advice we tried to give some of us when we were still together. Okay. I was sacked in 1990. I believe 
for giving that kind of advice. <laughs> and that, that was only four years into the, into the system. And many other people have faced similar uh, uh, results by their trying to advise on a different course. That's why after, you know, many, uh, after many years, people now know that if you want to thrive, to survive within an area, then you had better not uh, open your mouth to criticize. In fact, you must uh, glorify. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, uh, so it, the system builds its own uh, psychophancy. You know, when people realize this one tried, this was his end, this one tried, that was his end, this one tried, that was his end. So people start either keeping quiet or glorifying so that they can be more favored, okay. you know. So in 1992, a man called Alex Mukuru uh, staged uh, a, play. a play here called 30 Years of Bananas. Bananas yeah. And General Seven was one of uh, the people that uh, were in the audience uh, when the play was being, uh, uh, you launched. know, launched. And, uh, and, and you know that uh, that play, among other things, shows how the leaders Uganda had had thus far, and that was 30 years. We are now talking 60. <laughs> That was 30 years. Mm -hmm. And Museven had been in power for six years at that stage. And uh, Alex was showing that all the leaders eventually had no ears. They had lost their ears. They could not hear. And he left the question mark on what would happen to the current, to the leader then, who was General Museven in the audience, whether he too will. Uh, go ahead and lose his ears. Don't now you can imagine yeah. if those who stayed in office for eight years, nine years had totally lost their ears. What about those who have been in office for 40 years? Doctor, they have even lost speaking their of heads. leadership, <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of leadership, I, I want us to touch a bit on the leadership of the Uganda Airlines. Uh, the Kosase Committee has brought to light so many things. Uh, among them, of course, um, the fact that you do have the airline's leadership qualifications being questioned, how much they aren't being questioned, and uh, really, what's the future of the airline that is quote-unquote making losses as we speak, yet it was an investment that was supposed to bring about a boost to the economy of Uganda. What do you make of all this that is happening around the Uganda Airlines? Totally expected. A hundred percent expected. You see, it's like the Paris model we started with. When there was talk about the revival of Uganda Airlines, I tweeted saying that if this talk gets to fruition and the Uganda Airlines is reestablished, a few people will be laughing all the way to the banks while the rest of the country will be crying. This was before the airline actually was revived. And I have been reminding people that this, I am not a prophet. You know, some people even th now think that. Prophet keys a message. I am not a prophet. But some things are very easily predictable once you know where. Uh, the vehicle is going, you can tell, you know, uh, the next stop, you, it will be seen. So, uh, Uganda had assets, public assets, before NRM came to power. What happened to those assets? You know, 
including Uganda Airlines. This Uganda Airlines is totally a fake thing. You, there is Uganda Airlines, which is established by law. Uganda Airlines Act of 1970. I don't think that that act has even been repealed. So there is a Uganda Airlines by law, which is not this one. This one is a private company. So what then is going to happen to this one in light of what is uh, being presented? Well, it's already happening. You don't need again to... It's going to crash? It, 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 you know, it, 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 it is going to be eaten. It's, part, it's a conduit, you see. It's not intended to, uh, you know, provide uh, uh, efficient service uh, that will generate money for Ugandans and uh, achieve whatever missions uh, are written uh, in its papers. It's a conduit like other conduits okay. to, to siphon off yeah. money. And that's why, uh, you know, I told you about institutional governance. Like the parish model, the, the way it doesn't have an institutional uh, framework that can ensure achieving its objective. The same with the uh, Uganda Airlines. What is its institutional framework? It is a company owned by two people. Number one? Uh, was uh, the, uh, uh, Katumba or Amala? Number two? Uh, number two, I think, is Matia Kasaija. Okay. Who own shares is a, of a private company. Mm -hmm. It's a private limited liability right. company. Doctor, allow me to say it in Uganda. <laughs> um, uh, we, time is first spent for us. I think we'll have an opportunity to continue this conversation. But as we sign out from morning at NTV this morning, I want to ask you a tough question. What would you like to be written on your stone? when you die? I wouldn't like to uh, start building my grave <laughs> and laboring it. But I, you know, have spent the largest part of my life seeking justice. Just justice. Mm -hmm. uh, some people confuse it to, to seeking power mm -hmm. or seeking to occupy an office. Mm -hmm. But my passion is justice. Uh, so that each one can pursue their uh, passions in a free environment uh, and with equal opportunities. That is all. And if, by the grace of God, that is achieved before I die, I will be a very, very happy man. Uh, and, uh, you know, what people then say about my legacy, I would leave it to them. I wouldn't want to be my judge. All right. Well, thank you so much, Doctor. It's a great it was pleasure. A pleasure. Great pleasure. Uh, have have a great week. And have a great you. week, Ugandans out there. All right. Uh, at the end of the day, justice is what is on his heart until the day he breathes his, heart, his last. My question to you this morning is that you and I don't know exactly when we're going to pack our bags either and go. Uh, but between your public life and your private life, what do you want?